This is a big deal. This compliance attorney is like. So, so we are guaranteed to have quorum, just uh, still waiting for a few folks. Um, as somebody who is often late to committee, I'm getting a taste of my own medicine here, so. Uh, <laughs> so, but we will have quorum in a second and then we'll get started. Hello, my name is Jeremiah Ellison, uh, and I am the Vice Chair of the Housing Policy and Development Committee. Um, uh, this is our regular meeting of HPD. Um, I am joined by Council Members Goodman, Bender, and Schrader, uh, and we are a quorum of the committee. We have three items today, two consent items um, and one discussion item. Uh, we'll take up the consent items first. Uh, item number one is confirming the designation uh, of Tracy Scott as interim director of the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. And um, item uh, number two is uh, passage of a resolution uh, transferring uh, $180,000 for the 4D affordable housing um, incentive program. Um, and uh, I'll uh, see if my colleagues want to pull any of the consent items for discussion. Um, and then I will move to, uh, to, to, to approve both items. Um, uh, all those in favor say aye. aye. And uh, the consent items are approved. Uh, next, we will move on to um, item number three, which is a uh, receiving and filing of the report um, uh, on uh, um, our inclusionary uh, housing policies uh, compliance alternatives. So with that, Mayor Brennan, thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. <laughs> Um, I'm Andrea Brennan, Director of Housing Policy and Development um, in CPED at the city. I'm pleased to introduce this item and the city's consultants with Grounded Solutions Network to present on compliance alternatives for inclusionary housing policies. I'm standing before you now, but we have a, a, a rather large interdepartmental staff team involved in this work, including CPED Housing, Long Range Planning, Development Services Divisions, the City Attorney's Office, um, Development Finance Group of um, Finance uh, and Property Services, and Council Member Offices. Before introducing Grounded Solutions Network for their presentation to you, I'd like to provide some context for where we are in the process. 
In December of 2018, the City Council adopted the Minneapolis 2040 Comprehensive Plan, which allows for more development capacity to support increased housing supply, diversity, and affordability throughout the city. Minneapolis 2040 also supports mixed income housing development throughout the city. To help achieve the city's affordable housing goals, the council approved a staff direction in tandem with the Minneapolis 2040 plan, directing staff to develop a comprehensive inclusionary housing policy for city council consideration um, this year in 2019. The city council approved a framework for this policy. Under the framework, the policy will apply to all residential projects seeking site plan approval, subject to a to be yet to be determined threshold. The policy will apply citywide, not just uh, certain geographic areas. Rental housing projects will be required to produce either 10% of the units affordable to households uh, with incomes at or below 60% of the area median income, without any city subsidy, or a developer could opt to provide 20% of the units affordable to households with incomes at or below 50% of the area median income and be eligible for city financial assistance. The policy will also include affordability requirements for ownership projects, and there are many policy elements that still need to be developed, including the topic that will be presented by Grounded Solutions Network today on compliance alternatives. The framework adopted by the City Council in December was recommended by staff and city consultants based on economic analysis and stakeholder feedback over the last three and a half years. Grounded Solutions Network produced two reports, one in 2016 and one in 2018. Both of these reports are available on the city's website. To develop the comprehensive inclusionary housing policy, the city issued a request for proposals in early 2019. Grounded Solutions Network was selected based on their extensive expertise and experience assisting local governments with inclusionary housing policies nationwide. They are here this week to present to the HPD committee uh, and hold stakeholder meetings on the topic of compliance alternatives. The input they receive this week will help inform their policy recommendations to us. We expect to bring draft policy recommendations back to the HPD committee, to this committee uh, on October 20, sorry, October 16th, and um, a request for council action to approve a policy on December 4th. The purpose of today's presentation is to provide information on compliance alternatives and identify questions and feedback from the committee to inform policy recommendations. So with that, I am pleased to introduce uh, Stephanie Reyes with Grounded Solutions Network to, um, to present. Thank you. Real quick, I, I forgot to mention, uh, A, I wanted to emphasize that last point you made that this is, uh, we are receiving information, this is a receiving file, that yes. we're not getting a recommendation today, but that we are being presented uh, uh, with information to help us, uh, to help inform uh, future decisions. Uh, you know, so it's not a debate, it's not a decision point. Uh, this is a presentation from Grounded Solutions. I did forget to mention that as a part of this, we'll also be receiving a filing, uh, a short public comment period. I know that there are some members of the public who are interested to speak. Uh, we'll allow uh, groups and or individuals to uh, have, uh, to speak for three minutes after the presentation um, and just wanted to make sure that the public knew uh, those two things, so. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank Welcome. you, Andrea, and thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. It's, I'm glad to be back here at this illustrious body for a second time. So today we're going to talk about offering developers alternative ways to comply with an inclusionary housing policy other than building the required affordable units on site. According to Grounded Solutions research, 78% of inclusionary housing programs across the country offer one or more compliance alternatives. There are four main types of alternatives that are offered. About half of programs offer the option to pay a fee in lieu of building units on site. Um, half of programs offer the op opportunity to build units off site in another location. About a quarter of programs offer the opportunity to dedicate land for the use of for affordable housing. And 19% of programs offer the opportunity to preserve existing affordable housing units within the city as affordable housing for the long term. A couple more details on each of these. 
Uh, in lieu fees are most frequently assessed as a fee per affordable unit required. In addition to being the most commonly offered compliance alternative, in lieu fees are also the most commonly used alternative uh, for large part because they're simply very easy for developers to implement and use. Uh, and there are a variety of situations where it might make a lot of sense to have an in lieu fee option available, which I'll go into in a few minutes. Off-site production can be a good alternative if you have a strong, affordable housing developer community uh, who can partner to build those units off-site, and also if those developers have relatively easy access to land on which to build affordable housing. Uh, in this example, the building on the left is the Lumina Luxury Condo Development in San Francisco, uh, and they met their inclusionary housing obligation by building the all-affordable building on the right in a different location. Land donation can be a helpful option if uh, in your community it's different to obtain land to build affordable units on. This is actually the neighborhood where I live in the city of San Mateo, California. Uh, this was a redevelopment of an 83-acre horse racing track and the master developer dedicated the site in the upper right corner there for use for affordable housing as part of meeting their inclusionary obligation. Uh, land donation doesn't always have to work in this way. You don't always have to have a huge site of which you dedicate a small part. It could be you dedicate a small parcel of land elsewhere in the city that's just for use for affordable housing. Many communities offer this option. Um, it's not one that's very frequently used, but when it is used, it tends to be a real win-win, so it's nice to have it on the table. And the last most popular option is this concept of placing affordability restrictions on existing housing units in the city after conducting any needed rehabilitation. Um, this can, in theory, be a great alternative if your city has affordable units that are at risk of being acquired, rehabilitated, and the, rent, the rents raised significantly. Um, but there are not that many examples of this alternative being used anywhere in the country that we could find. Uh, I think because it's just a little complex to find the right set of circumstances to, to put it to use. So those are the four main options. Occasionally cities will offer some other compliance alternatives, something like you, know, you can build senior housing or housing for disabled, or just make us a proposal and at the city's discretion we'll let you know if that meets our needs. Uh, but again, these are the four most common options. And what's interesting is that all four of these compliance alternatives tend to end up with generally the same outcome at the end of the day. So most of the time what you end up with is affordable units being built in an all affordable building on a different site in a different location by an affordable housing developer. There are some exceptions to that. So for example, you could use in lieu fee revenue to say further write down the affordability of existing affordable units in another development or something like that. But in general, this is what you're gonna find. Uh, and I bring that up because as I walk through the pros and cons of compliance alternatives, I'm gonna do so generally. Um, here are the pros and cons of alternatives. If there are places where one of these options has a specific benefit or drawback, I'll call that out. So let me start with some of the benefits of offering compliance alternatives in your policy. One big one is it gives you the opportunity to leverage other affordable housing funding sources, which can lead to a greater number of affordable units being built than would have been built on site. Uh, in 2014, Grounded Solutions Network did an in-depth study of Seattle's inclusionary ordinance, and we found that in that case, uh, they were able to leverage $205,000 of federal, state, and local funds per affordable unit in a certain type of affordable housing project for only a $57,000 city investment. So that's like a one to three and a half leveraging ratio. And in the set of projects that we studied, this leveraging led to 28% more affordable units being built with these in Luffy funds than would have been built if those developers had used the on-site option. Now, that leveraging is not necessarily replicable in every community. It depends on the availability of federal funds, et cetera. Uh, but it is one example of pretty compelling effective leveraging. Another benefit is that the developers who build affordable housing overall you know, really have an expertise in both building and managing those units. And so tapping into that expertise can be helpful in a couple of different ways. Um, a big one is that, as you're all aware, affordable units in mixed income developments can only be required to maintain their affordability for 20 years, 
or for 30 years if tax increment financing is used. But affordable housing built by an all-affordable developer, those don't have those same restrictions, and so there's a likelihood that those units could remain affordable in perpetuity. Um, it's a pretty big benefit, and that alone could be a reason for Minneapolis to seriously consider compliance alternatives. Uh, and in addition, affordable housing developers tend to offer supportive services and amenities to the residents of their buildings that can provide significant benefits to those households. Uh, compliance alternatives also provide a lot of flexibility, uh, particularly in LUFIs. Money is, is uh, <laughs> very flexible, and also those fees tend to have fewer restrictions even than, say, federal affordable housing funds. So some examples of how you might want to take advantage of compliance alternatives, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can achieve deeper levels of affordability sometimes with alternatives than you can with on-site development. Uh, in Seattle, their in Luffy funded units served 30 to 60 percent of area median income, whereas on site would have served 80 percent. Uh, you can also uh, do your own work to preserve the affordability of existing units, be those uh, deed restricted units whose restrictions are expiring or um, currently unregulated affordable uh, buildings, ensuring that they remain affordable. Uh, with fees, you can fund more rental affordable housing or homeownership affordable housing, depending on what the need is in your community at any given moment. Uh, some communities also find that the market tends to provide units with fewer bedrooms, like studios, one bedrooms, maybe two bedrooms, whereas what might be needed for uh, low-income households could be more family-sized units. So you can use your compliance alternatives to fill that gap in what's being provided. And finally, if you're concerned that historically lower cost neighborhoods might be experiencing or just starting to experience significant housing price increases that could displace current residents, it's possible to take advantage of compliance alternatives to, say, collect in lieu fees from uh, projects in downtown and use those to create and preserve affordable units in those neighborhoods that are starting to transition. Compliance alternatives can also be a great solution to address a variety of specific situations where on-site development is difficult for one reason or another. So a couple of examples of that. Um, there are some challenges to building affordable units on-site in developments that are primarily intended for students, right? So one example of that is you know, the design of units that are intended to house multiple students might not be the same as a design that's needed for a non-student household. Uh, with compliance alternatives, you can make sure that market built student housing does contribute to affordable housing in some way without some of the downsides of the on-site compliance. Uh, and then there's also this really important case of extremely high-end luxury housing, particularly ownership housing, where the cost to provide an affordable unit on site is so great that it might not be the best use of limited affordable housing resources. And in fact, if you allow compliance alternatives, you could get multiple affordable units in another place as opposed to just one affordable unit on site. So um, Chicago, they generally, in their inclusion area policy, require that at least a quarter of the required units be built on site. Um, but for that specific narrow niche of downtown for sale projects, those are allowed to use compliance alternatives for all of their units. And finally, providing compliance alternatives can make it more likely that more projects will be successfully find a way to pencil out under the inclusionary zoning requirements. If you only have an on-site requirement, there will likely be slightly more projects that end up deciding that they just can't move forward because they can't find a way to make it pencil. And uh, the feasibility benefit of compliance alternatives, this was actually borne out in a really interesting study of inclusionary programs in the San Francisco Bay Area compared to programs in the Boston area. The San Francisco area programs, which offered several compliance alternatives, did not have any effect on housing production. Uh, but the Boston area programs, which offered few or no compliance alternatives, did end up having a small effect on housing starts. So, Compliance alternatives could play a valuable role in Minneapolis to reduce the likelihood that the inclusionary policy would impact housing production even a little bit. Of course, there are some potential downsides to offering compliance alternatives. 
the biggest one has to do with this concept of creating mixed income development, right? So Minneapolis 2040 set a goal of seeing mixed income development throughout the city. And one of the action steps to accomplish that goal was to expand the inclusionary housing policy. So we know that requiring the affordable units and inclusionary policy to be built on site guarantees that those units will be built in places where market rate units are being built. And as Minneapolis 2040 notes, uh, market rate housing is mostly being built in high amenity areas with access to transportation, jobs, et cetera, uh, where sometimes the cost of housing is out of reach of middle and lower income Minneapolis residents. So if you require units to be built on site, that guarantees that lower income residents will have access to those higher amenity neighborhoods where market rate development is happening. And there is significant research showing the benefits of living in a mixed income neighborhood with access to amenities. Um, requiring on-site development is not the only way to ensure that lower income households have access to those higher amenity neighborhoods. It's just a very reliable way. Uh, but requiring that on-site development is the only way to guarantee that those affordable units will be in the same building as the market rate units, right? Uh, but that said, the research on whether there are benefits to residents of including affordable and market rate units in the same building as opposed to just the same neighborhood is much less clear. So depending on how your compliance alternatives are structured, you may end up with a majority of the affordable units being built in lower cost areas rather than the higher cost high amenity neighborhoods. So a couple of ways that can happen. Um, if you have one consistent in lieu fee amount across the city, like you see here, on-site production will probably be less expensive than paying the fee in some of those lower cost areas, but on-site production will be more expensive than paying the fee in the higher cost areas. So you'll get fees in higher cost areas and units in lower cost areas. Uh, and similarly, if you allow off-site development as a compliance alternative, and there's the same percentage of affordable units required in on-site or off-site, it could make a lot of economic sense for a developer to choose to build those affordable units off-site in a lower cost area rather than on-site in a higher cost area. And then compounding that problem, the affordable housing developers who tend to be the ones who implement any of these compliance alternatives, use fee revenues, et cetera, they also tend to build most of their affordable units in lower cost areas because the cost of land is lower and sort of the federal affordable housing funding guidelines and restrictions, et cetera. So long and short, if part of the goal is to make sure that lower income households have access to affordable units in high amenity areas, you need to be careful with how you structure your compliance alternatives. There are lots of exciting options for how to do that, which I will share with you in a moment. <coughs> Um, all that said, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you may end up deciding that for your community, it makes sense to collect fees in higher income areas and spend those to create and preserve affordable homes in areas that are about to transition. Um, if you only have an on-site requirement, then <laughs> you'll only see affordable units built through your inclusionary policy in those transitioning neighborhoods after market rate development starts to happen, which could potentially be too late to try to slightly put the brakes on displacement. A couple other downsides, uh, a little more straightforward. Uh, so if you build affordable units on site with market rate units, they get built at the same time, right? They get leased up at the same time. If you collect fees, it can take a while to actually spend those. In Seattle, average of 3.9 years to spend the fees. Interesting story though about Seattle, um, they ended up collecting most of their fees during an economic boom time, as you might expect. Uh, but then with this delay, they actually spent their fees during a downturn. So that meant that nothing else was being built. That lowered the construction costs for the affordable housing developers, lowered land costs, and overall probably meant that they were able to do more and make those dollars go farther than they would have if they were built in the boom time. So no guarantee that would happen somewhere else, but it seems like a plausible scenario for other communities as well. <laughs> Excuse me. A couple other downsides I mentioned earlier. Um, you can only use your in-lieu fees to leverage other funds to the extent that those other funds exist and are not being uh, competed for with other uses. Uh, and then we often find that for a variety of reasons, communities tend to set their compliance alternative requirements 
so low that they end up producing far fewer affordable units than would be produced on site. Um, and this is particularly a problem that we've seen historically within Luffy's being set extremely low. This is a very easily solvable problem. Uh, it's quite straightforward to come up with a reasonable formula that makes those costs relatively equivalent, but it's just something you need to watch out for as you're putting your policy together. And finally, you know, there is a perception issue. So regardless of all the benefits I just ran through of offering compliance alternatives, uh, it can look to the public like this is a loophole or a way for developers to buy their way out of their obligations. So that's something to consider as well. Fortunately, there are ways to address at least some of these downsides through policy. So thinking about the question of creating mixed income communities in high amenity areas, one option is to vary your in lieu fees geographically, right? So you can see Chicago does this. <coughs> the fees are higher in higher or hotter market areas. You can also set requirements for the geographic use of alternatives. So Santa Monica says that if you're gonna build units offsite, they have to be built within a quarter mile of the original market rate project. Uh, and then Boston requires that at least half of its in lieu fees be spent in neighborhoods with a demonstrated need for affordable housing. To address concerns about delaying construction, for offsite construction, you can require that units be permitted and built uh, concurrently or prior to the market rate units. And then to address some of the other concerns I, I mentioned, um, you know, as I said, it's relatively straightforward to set your compliance alternative requirements high enough that you ensure that you're getting at least the equivalent number of units that you would get on site. And then you also have the option to limit by right use of alternatives to only a few certain edge cases, right? So you could say, you know, student housing, access to alternatives by right, luxury ownership housing, you could use alternatives. Other projects, maybe they need to ask for city approval in order to use a compliance alternative or they're not eligible. You could also require that at least some of the affordable units be built on site. I mentioned again, Chicago, a quarter of units must be built on site. And then you can just structure your compliance alternatives to make the on-site performance the preferable and more financially beneficial option most of the time, right? So for example, in Santa Monica, they have an offsite option, but if you build offsite, you have to build 25% more affordable units than you would have if you built onsite. Uh, and you can also set your in lieu fee to a number that will generally be slightly higher than the cost of onsite performance for most projects. That'll give you a majority of folks choosing onsite development. And the last point I'll make on this topic is that as you think about compliance alternatives, it is important to make sure that any alternative you offer is a genuine alternative, right? So you don't wanna say, you can build offsite if you build three times as many units, that's not something that's gonna be feasible for any project, it doesn't make sense. Um, that said, it doesn't mean that the compliance alternative has to be preferable for all or most projects. Uh, it just means that it has to be a reasonable alternative some of the time for some projects. And before I turn it over to discussion, Andrea mentioned that we did host a couple of um, stakeholder meetings yesterday, one in the morning with some developers and one in the afternoon with some nonprofit members. I think some of those folks are here today and will be able to speak for themselves, which is wonderful, but I did wanna just give you a couple of highlights from each of those conversations. Uh, so in our developer focus group, we got a very clear message that in their opinion, inclusionary zoning is not financially feasible in Minneapolis. And several folks mentioned uh, that they believe that development projects are currently right on the edge of financial feasibility and that market rate projects can't afford to contribute to affordable housing without subsidy. Uh, and I just wanna reassure you that Grounded Solutions take is that while the exact amount of an affordable housing contribution from market rate development can vary with different market cycles, we are very confident that market rate development in Minneapolis does have the ability to contribute to affordable housing. From our nonprofit focus group, a couple of main points we heard. Um, folks were generally in agreement that providing flexibility through compliance alternatives makes sense. Uh, they emphasize that it is important to ensure that the contribution from the alternative compliance is equivalent to on-site production. 
there was a lot of interest in affordable homes to serve uh, lower income households. So we talked about how 50% of area median income is a greater need than 60%. And then there was also a suggestion that when housing TIF districts are used, that perhaps any excess TIF that was generated from that project could be directed to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So with that, I will turn it back to you for discussion and feedback. Ms. Reyes, thank you for uh, the presentation. It's extremely helpful. Um, I will uh, look to my colleagues to see if there are any questions regarding the presentation. Councilmember Schrader. Ms. Reyes, just to go back to, to the developer of feedback, so like the whole point of the session was to gather feedback on compliance. So am I to understand that they had nothing to offer? There was nothing that could be offered for an IZ policy that would work in their minds? Their position was that because the IZ policy in their minds is not financially feasible, that there is no point in talking about the compliance alternatives. Okay, and, just, and just to make it the streaks, that seems a lot after city council has already passed an interim policy, after we've talked about this for many years, after I think we're on our third contract with folks doing the study. <laughs> um, so if that's, it really was nothing, that's unfortunate. Thanks. Council President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This may be more like reflections or ideas, but I would invite any comment back from you or staff. Um, as you're talking about the different alternatives for compliance, one question I had was that in a city that already does fund new construction, leveraging other sources through our trust fund, the question became to me, you know, then do we want to use this as another source of funding for our trust fund, essentially? Or are we targeting this as a different approach that is deviating from what we already do for affordable housing production in our city? And I, you know, I'm very open to the answer to that question. I do think I've heard over the years that we've been discussing this policy a lot of interest from council members who see significant develop in their, development in their ward to have the units on site. And so I think that that was one of the sort of original reasons that we started exploring inclusionary zoning. When you look at maps of housing cost in our city, the places it's no surprise, but the places where we are seeing the most new construction are the places that rents have gone up. That was what the Cura study essentially showed. And if you look at places like my ward, where thousands of units have been built over the last decade, you know, having hundreds of units available at 50 or 60 percent AMI would make a difference to my constituents. So I think that's I just sort of maybe in boiling down the question that I think is before the council as we're at this juncture around um, the question of compliance alternatives. The core of the question is, do we want the units on site or nearby the new construction or are we really looking at, at this as a financial tool to to generate revenue for the trust fund? Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't think it's a revenue generating tool for the trust fund, but I might be the only person who has that point of view. Um, I am in one of the wards that has lots of development, and one of the things that I've seen both in the ward I represent and also in the third ward is this model that wasn't discussed where developers are building one project with two buildings. So one is financed privately, and they can finance the project privately and the other which is on the exact same site potentially sharing amenities and also maybe even sharing parking and greenhouses and trails and access to parks and all that is built immediately adjacent uh, that's also happening i believe on the fire station site in the third ward where they're building a full market rate building immediately next to a full uh, affordable building, which I think makes it easier generally to finance, and I hadn't heard that discussed as a compliance alternative, um, but it sounds like that would be one way to uh, acknowledge that it's difficult to finance mixed use within mixed income within mixed use. And so I would like to see that dis um, thought through by our staff so we could make that a compliance alternative. Um, because I think that that's something also that makes neighborhoods really happy. I mean, in the neighborhood that I live in, we're going to have one of these projects, and people in my neighborhood wanted the affordable housing. They fought for it. I mean, I think they would have been okay with all of it being affordable. Uh, but the process of getting money to build affordable housing, even for private developers, is very difficult. So I think we need to, if, if we're not going to have developers telling us what to do other than telling us what we can do with our own money, which I don't love, as you know, and I'm looking right at you, thank you for making those suggestions, 
I was looking at Steve Kramer, but you can suggest how we can tax for it all you want. I also want to know what everybody else is going to do. And uh, I do think that that compliance alternative is something that should be legitimately studied and made so that we can make sure that those projects succeed. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Um, did, did you want to address any any of the other any things brought up before we enter into public comment? No, this is all public. Awesome, uh, uh, Councilmember Bitter. Uh, maybe just to clarify, I mean, so my gut reaction as well is that really the only reason we would consider in lieu fees is if we're concerned about feasibility because the amount of money that we would raise through that source is sort of. My gut is that it would not be a significant increase to our trust fund, which we already use for that that tool, right? We're already funding affordable housing production through our trust fund. Um, so then sort of following that thread, if if we're also contemplating offering TIF financing for projects, in a sense, that's another version of, that's another way for us to address this issue of feasibility. So. If we're looking at in lieu fees, my sense of the council is that we would only look at in lieu fees if it was a question of feasibility, which we were already attempting to address through financing. But, you know, the council can weigh in, but I think that's kind of what we were both saying is that I don't think policymakers have been looking at this as a revenue generating source for the trust fund. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Goodman. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I also wanted to note that, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of the use of tax increment for anything, including this. Um, but I did, like many of you, receive a fairly well presented uh, proposal from Kelly Dorn, which is something that he had suggested to the governor's office, which was an alternative form of financing uh, for affordable housing. And I am going to be calling him and asking our city staff to meet with me and him so he can go through his idea even further. And I think that's also something downtown council is looking at, which might be slightly more palatable to me than tax increment, but not much. Um, but I do think any developer coming up with an idea that they can suggest to us that's out of the box is appreciated. And I think that those kinds of comments to us um, deserve uh, a, a feeling that out and seeing if that's possible. So I just wanted to note I have had the opportunity to talk to our housing staff and I am going to meet with them, mainly because he, he pitches it as an alternative to tax increments. So that, of course, brought, you know, I was excited to hear there was someone who had an alternative, although I think it's a similar thing. Uh, but I am willing to uh, address it and we'll be following up with him as well. Great. Um, and Councilmember Goodman, that point is well taken. I think all the more why, uh, all the more disappointing that we didn't actually get uh, 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 some feedback for this process uh, when it came to uh, meet, uh, our meeting with the developers. So hopefully we have some folks who um, are interested in speaking during the public comment period. Um, with no other questions from my colleagues, uh, then I will uh, open up. Um, oh, one last thing. Um, Council President Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a note on process, and maybe staff will comment on this um, as well, but I think this was really more from council side. So our intention was to have, um, you know, this information presented to us, a chance for council members on the committee, but then um, also other council members, you know, to think about this information, to follow up with staff or the consultants with any questions, and then sometime before their next visit, our intention and hope was to give a little more direction on some of these alternatives. So, for example, we think we probably want the final policy to include or not to include the in lieu fees. You know, if there's a question about maybe compliance alternatives make sense, but within a geographic area that's close to the building or not. So some of those kind of um, turning points of where the analysis and policy recommendations will come. And so that would likely come as a staff direction, you know, in the next couple of months between now and when the consultants are expected to come back for their next technical visit. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that um, uh, perspective. Thank you for put, laying that context down. Um, I'll now uh, open up for uh, for public comment. Um, I know that there are a number of groups and uh, individuals here who uh, would like to uh, speak on this issue. Um, I'll sort of, you know, these aren't so much parameters, but this is sort of my recommendation. Uh, because we are getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an analysis uh, from uh, our consultant, and because uh, we are not getting a recommendation at this time, I would I would ask that uh, we sort of keep comments to um, addressable addressable questions and concerns, uh, uh, because at this point we're not yet 
we're not yet debating uh, a course. Uh, and so, um, uh, so with that, uh, the clock is there. And, go ahead, um, Councilmember Goodman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just want to note I need to leave at 2.30. I didn't know there was going to be public comment, and I saw the agenda, and I assumed it was okay to schedule something at 2.30, so no disrespect for anyone I might not hear. Noted, and we will try to keep it short because if we lose a council member, then we lose quorum. So, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair, in that case, I'll just move to receive and file the presentation. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, so uh, council member Bender has moved to receive and file the presentation, which is uh, sort of 3.1 here uh, in the discussion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 And that report is received and filed. Uh, with that, we will take public comment. Uh, please try to keep it to three minutes. Uh, and uh, I don't have a list in front of me, but uh, I'll let folks sort of self-regulate as they, as they go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Steve Kramer. I'm President and CEO of the Minneapolis Downtown Council. Uh, I know you've had a long day already. So, but we do appreciate a chance really for the first time in this setting to make comments on inclusionary zoning. So our organization did bring together this group, Minneapolis, uh, Building Minneapolis Together, which is a wide swath of active developers in Minneapolis who have developed, owned, and managed literally thousands of affordable housing units. And we have engaged one-on-one -on -one with many of you, with staff, and with advocates for well over a year on the inclusionary zoning policy issue. So we're half a year into implementation of the interim policy, and it's, it's clear that its applicability is limited. Uh, many projects were in the ground already, so we see the cranes around, around downtown. A lot of projects rushed in to meet the deadline at the end of, of last year, so the Planning Commission agendas were packed, as Councilmember Schrader certainly knows. And then others have come forward since the policy, but the policy just doesn't apply. So we haven't felt a great impact yet. Uh, we also, on the other side of that coin, haven't seen new affordable units put in the pipeline yet. So. For us, what seemed important to focus on last year, it's really important now to focus on, on this question as you move towards a, a more permanent policy that has broader applicability. And the, and the view of our group hasn't changed. The basic underlying issue that our market confronts is a demand supply imbalance that puts pressure on all rents, especially rents of existing class B and C buildings, which are also, of course, our, 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 NOAA, our NOAA stock. You can't see this, this slide, but it's a Met Council analysis of a number of markets that have the same problem. And in our case, between 20, 2010 and 2018, uh, our population grew by 8.5% regionally, and certainly the city mirrors that, but housing units grew by 5.3%, so we continue to fall further and further behind. And from the development community's perspective, again, these folks that have dealt thousands of affordable housing units, any regulatory policy that overreaches and causes projects to become financially infeasible will deter investment, slow down production overall, and exacerbate this fundamental underlying problem. So as you move to consider an IZ policy that will be more sweeping in its reach, it's really important in our view to, to think this through again. The feasibility analysis that you based your interim policy on last fall has not been updated since, as Stephanie indicated, and in, in fairness to Ground Solutions, they weren't asked to update it either. But, you know, from a development standpoint, it hasn't gotten any better to develop. Land costs rise, labor costs rise, materials costs rise. So the, the local developers had serious concerns about the val validity of the feasibility work last year, and it hasn't gotten any better, as I said. You may remember that our collective recommendation last year was to adopt an IZ policy focused on 10% of units at 60% AMI affordability with financial assistance available to ensure uh, financial feasibility. We also recommended a series of policy and program ideas focused on directly producing and preserving affordable housing. Hey, Mr. Kramer, I'll let you finish that thought. But then Wait, we and just on. one last, if I can address Mr. Chairman Councilmember Schrader's point. We didn't have a satisfying session yesterday with Grounded Solutions. Our group doesn't think the underlying policy is right yet. We hope it can get right, but alternatively complying with the wrong policy didn't make sense to our group. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Schrader. Sure, just Mr. Kramer got a couple of questions. Just then, I'm assuming this is that's correct. Okay. That's correct, Councilman. Just, I mean, have uh, just going over the housing goals. I think we agree as yes. a city for most of these, but overall and with all this, why it is, it is a little frustrating is what is the market doing for any of these? I mean, every you have five direct goals. I would say 
you can make an argument for four that the market is doing. Um, and as you pointed out, we're losing affordability as a city at a, at a very a terrifying rate. Um, and the city's working on this. You know, we have programs for it. We're working innovatively to conserve what we have to produce new units. We're doing this head on. We, we've actually would call this an incentive. I would call this an incentive based. You know, we are helping developers that want to do affordable housing. We are providing funding for that. Um, and we're not the only ones. You know, you can get that fund funding from national, from the state, from other philanthropic. Um, and what I'm what we're really hoping to do with an inclusionary zoning, and not just us, but every city that has one, it is to have the market pay its share and to do more of that. And so, you know, this is going to be a change, um, but it is something that as we, you know, we passed 2040 and we made a commitment, at least I made a commitment to my constituents that if you're going to have housing, if you're gonna have this level of growth in a city that we, you know, look down the line and see the numbers, it's coming. We need to be able to make sure everyone can afford to live here and that that um, core value that we have is preserved. And that's just not something we're seeing from the market on its own without mm -hmm. incentives. I'm not mm -hmm. seeing an increase in starter homes, not seeing an increase in other uh, low income housing. Um, so, you know, on that, I'd like to hear more like what other you things you suggest. I think Councilmember Goodman put it best. You know, I don't need suggestions on what to do with the state's money or right. other people with our own money. Well, Mr. Chairman, Councilmember, th thank you. We do have a series of suggestions. Some of them certainly are, are uh, use of public resources, that's for sure, because in my experience, and as you know, I've developed myself hundreds of units of affordable housing, including highly affordable housing, so I'm very familiar with all of those tools. Uh, the simple truth is you cannot bend the market to your, your will. You'll hear more about uh, the realities of putting together private equity, uh, putting together uh, capital stacks that, that meet the, the requirements of those the folks that control those resources. And, you know, those conditions are what they are. And so our concern is that to, 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 to have an impact on the ability to bring that private capital in will not address the affordability issue. It'll simply exacerbate the overall supply demand problem. And what you have to do is try to leverage that investment as best as you can without deterring it. So, and that's our concern, that the policy goes too far. We did make a recommendation. I mean, if you uh, would have a 10% policy with the availability of assistance where it's needed to make financial feasibility uh, stand, then we think that actually would be something worth doing and we could lock hand, we could lock arms and say we're working on this together. But as it stands now, we think the policy has gone too far and will be detrimental to your goals and certainly impact the ability of the city to deal with this fundamental problem of, of supply demand imbalance. Well, thank, thank you for that comment. I just want to follow up on it with a comment. There's yep. no question. Just if, if you really believe that to that extent, I would have expected a better outcome yesterday from the stakeholder meeting. I would have expected, and here's other solutions to make this work. So we do have the goal of making this work. Okay. Yeah, four, four, four pages worth of, of ideas. So. All right. Um, so given that we only have six more minutes of quorum, I did want to make sure that, um, you know, uh, we had somebody from the, uh, is it the BMT uh, coalition uh, represented here? Um, I know that there are other, uh, there are folks from uh, the Alliance and I see some of the housing advocates here. I'd love for, to give them the floor before we continued. Um, if there was anybody, Mr. Min. Uh, Steve, how you doing? I would love to give somebody from uh, <laughs> the the alliance or one of the other housing uh, advocacy groups uh, at least three minutes while we five, you know, while we uh, of the five while we still have quorum. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Trom Huang and I'm a new staff member at the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability. I'm here to express our support for a strong IZ policy to ensure that all growth and development taking place in the city benefits all residents. Um, we know that not any one housing policy is going to be the silver bullet, but we think that a strong loophole free IZ policy is really important to um, playing a role in that strong toolbox that you're creating to address our affordable housing crisis. And with IZ, we think that um, it's a really important part of continuing to work towards the creation of a more equitable housing system. And in regards to the presentation we just saw, um, the Alliance sees a lot of potential in, in lieu fees, um, especially with their flexibility, as long as they are calibrated in a way that can capture meaningful and equivalent value 
um, in place of building on-site units. And there's potential to put fees towards um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, like you had mentioned, using it to deepen the affordability of already maybe 60 to 80 percent units, and also increase affordability terms. And um, we hope that our comp plan goals can also be met through um, the creation of affordable units in every neighborhood and every ward. And so we hope that the final draft of this policy can find a balance between um, paying attention to not just the number of units, but also where they're located. And I think we saw in the presentation some ideas such as half the required units built on site and half through an alternative. And so I think that's something that we should strongly consider um, to achieve both the number and the geographic diversity that we want to see. And overall, we're just really excited to join the 900 plus jurisdictions and 25 states that have implemented IZ, and we look forward to working together. Um, thank you again for Granite Solutions Network for letting us be a part of this process for the past year. Um, it's been really valuable for us as a learning tool and also as an advocacy tool. Thanks. Thank you. Um, We've only got three more minutes left of quorum, uh, so if there were other sort of uh, addressable questions or concerns, uh, we'd love to hear hear that. And um, and then you know this might be the the last comment. Uh, and then of course, um, uh, uh, Steph, uh, Ms. Reyes, if you had any sort of responses that you wanted to give after this or not, no pressure. Um, you are more than welcome to do that. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Steve Min. I'm with Loopy Development, and as most of you know, I've done almost. Uh, 1,200 units of housing, 800 of them affordable in the last 10 years. Uh, so I'll try to do a wrap up for, on behalf of BMT. We were hoping to present our PowerPoint today uh, as a counterpoint to the GSN report, and we weren't given that opportunity. We'd like to have that opportunity at a future date. The GSN report from nine months ago was predicated on some flawed tax and expense data. We said that before the report was presented. We were not given the opportunity to pre uh, present to this committee when the first GSN report was given. And so the recommendations on the base policy that you received is based on flawed data. And we Sorry, well, real correct. We didn't, we didn't actually get any recommendations today. We received and filed a report. Mr. Thank Chairman, I'm, I'm speaking about nine months ago when they made a report, and you adopted an interim ordinance based on their recommendations, based on flawed data. We were not given the opportunity to speak then and make a present presentation then, and we still, today, we're limited to three minutes apiece rather than being able to present our PowerPoint. And, and we just think you need to meet with us as a group, other than, you know, two hours before the committee's report is received. I, it's just, this isn't a collaboration yet. I think we need to make that point clear. As an industry, we're in the best position to tell you what's going to work and not work. Guaranteed Solution Network is an advocate, and we expect them to report and recommend to you an IZ policy. You, as a policymaker board, have said you want to adopt an IZ policy, so we expect you're going to adopt an IZ policy. But we're concerned that your policy could, probably likely, will have the completely opposite effect on the production and preservation of affordable housing. We're trying to convey that message to you, and we think we're being ignored. We've opposed discussing the alternative compliance on IZ because we don't agree with the underlying policy yet. As an example, the city of Bloomington worked for two years with industry collaboratively and adopted a policy that industry embraces. We recommend you stop what you're doing, toss out your schedule, embrace us as an industry partner, and actually adopt a policy that the industry can embrace. Bloomington's policy is going to be successful because they took two years and worked with the industry. The industry supports the policy. You do not have that here in Minneapolis. We stand ready to partner, but we renew our caution that you are otherwise legislating against market forces, which is never a successful model for a democratic form of government. And if you think those who do the policy in the field, building both market rate and affordable, don't know what we're talking about, the outcome will be a, d a reduction in production and a heightening of the crisis. More NOAA will be cannibalized for market rate and will continue to go in the opposite direction. So we urge you to stop, work with us differently, and we'd be happy to get to some conclusion as Mr. Kramer discussed. Thank you. I wanted to see real quick if we had any other um, uh, comments, but um, I wanted to see real quick if we had any other I was weird. I wanted to see if we had any other comments um, uh, that, from the public. Yeah. 
Tim Thompson Housing Justice Center. Um, as you know, uh, the city from time to time gets accused of moving too quickly on policy measures and not providing for sufficient input. I don't think anyone could say that about the process of considering an inclusionary zoning ordinance. Andrea talked about a three and a half year process of deliberation over this. We've been talking and working with city officials for a decade on this policy. And uh, in my experience, it is one of the most vetted and deliberative efforts that I've seen the city undertake in this area, with financial feasibility always at top of mind. So uh, it seems to me that at some point you have to make judgments on the best available evidence and you have to move on. Um, and we are now at a point where because Minneapolis is kind of late in the game coming to inclusionary zone and we've got a large body of experience from other cities around the country to learn from. So we know how to evaluate financial feasibility, determine what works and what doesn't, and I think it's time to move on. And I would simply add on the question of alternative compliance options, uh, we would support alternative compliance options as long as they're providing equivalent value. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, are there any other comments? Yeah, please. Thank you very much, Chair Olson and committee, um, for the opportunity to provide comment today. My name is uh, Joseph Paris. I'm a Minneapolis resident. I live at 700 South 2nd Street in the 3rd Ward. I was born and raised in Minneapolis. I've lived here for most of my life. I love this city and I was excited to be a part of helping it grow. So about a year and a half ago, I joined Ryan Companies to be a housing developer. We at Ryan care very deeply about this city and this community. It is our home. Our headquarters is here. We live here. We're honored to, with the opportunity to be able to build here as well. We joined Building Minneapolis together because we're concerned about the housing affordability in this city and we want to be part of the solution. Building Minneapolis Together, as previously mentioned, is a broad-based group of, organ of private groups, public groups, not-for-profit developers, for-profit developers, market rate developers, affordable housing developers, in addition to civic leaders and others who care deeply about this community. The housing ecosystem is very, very delicate, as we presented in our, our presentation. There's been a lot of municipalities that have passed very well-intentioned housing policies to try to solve one housing issue and in turn have ended up making their overall housing much less affordable for many of their residents. We harbor these concerns about the framework of the current IZ policy being developed. I would encourage and implore the Council to not follow policy precedents of cities that are objectively more expensive and less affordable than ours is. Minneapolis has shown to be the national leader on zoning policy, and we think we can also be the national leader on affordable housing policy. I would request that the Council review the policy recommendations from building Minneapolis together. We at Ryan are in full support of the BMT policy recommendations. These are very innovative and progressive tools that won't constrain new supply um, and will be pillars to helping us make Minneapolis be a more affordable place to live in the future. So thank you very much for the opportunity to make comment. Uh, great. Um, you know, given that this is public comment and not a public hearing, you know, I'd love a chance to sort of cut this off at some point. But I did want to see if there was anybody else uh, from the public who wanted to give uh, another word, um, uh, you know, ask any questions um, uh, or uh, sort of voice any addressable concerns. Dan Collison, uh, wear a lot of hats, affordable housing advocate, also work for the Downtown Council. And I do want to applaud and chair, thank you Vice Chair Allison for that invitation, I'll be quick. I do want to applaud Councilmember Goodman's reflection that this is a space of creativity and that uh, working with private developers in relationship to density perspectives, particularly in coming and talking about downtown Minneapolis, which is the space that I advocate for affordable housing and creativity. I would just ask as the policy moves forward that there are many tools, that there is a sense of innovation that can be leveraged into the policy and all the edges around it, and that each project can be considered almost uniquely as something needing to be approached creatively with the policy in mind. And so I'm not really giving a perspective other than I want to advocate for that kind of engagement, that each project is unique, complex, very expensive, hard to pull off, and particularly downtown where we cannot build any more six-story, 100% affordable. That's a burden I feel like it's off the table because of the new 2040 upzoning, and I understand that too. And so flexibility, being able to work with the private sector, and coming up with creative solutions as the policy comes into play, I just wanted to say uh, would be terrific. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, without any other, oh, yeah. Please uh, introduce. My name is Trevor Martinez. I work for Schaefer Richardson. We're located at 900 North 3rd Street. Um, we're also a member in support of the BMT policy objectives is here. My, the uh, thing that I'm here to talk just very briefly about today is to give a big picture overview as to one of the alternative compliance tools specifically as it relates to the, using TIF on the 20% and 50% um, target. And so big picture, the reason why this is challenging to use TIF for this perspective is because of its variability. Um, because of its, its um, sorry, in order to fill the gap here, you need to have a site that has low current taxes in order for there to be large increment that is generated for a particular property. In areas in which you are doing refill or you're doing infill development, that low tax base to be able to gain a large amount of increment is not always sufficient to be able to fill a gap at a 50% hole because it requires the, that there's a very low like threshold to begin with. And in addition to that, the site has to be able to accommodate density and it have few to no design or constructability obstacles on the site, such as the ability to configure appropriate levels of parking, access, and otherwise. Um, in other states and in other areas, ways that this has been done, ways that this has been dealt with has been more through pilot or abatement programs as opposed to tax increment financing programs because that allows a lower amount of administrative burden um, as well as it reduces the amount of variability that comes with the fact that TIF is generated off of an increment and is not based on just the pure proposal that is in front of you. Um, outside of that, the some of the obstacles to the mixed income development that happen is that lenders are particularly more cautious in sizing proceeds which hit the gap and then as uh, our presentation to the to the Grounded Solutions Network yesterday showed that investors, it creates market pressures to switch from uh, building new housing and increasing supply in order and shifting it towards the redevelopment or reinvestment in NOAA properties, which limits uh, and causes upward pressure on rents in NOAA properties. We strand strongly with the BNT and are happy to be uh, transparent about the confluence of factors. We're not a black box. We're not trying to stand here complain. We're willing to share information and data and provide you with the analysis that, that comes to the same conclusion that we have to be able to work with you towards a better solution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that sort of pivots me to a good question for Grand Solutions. Um, the, uh, uh, that, op that, that option is not intended to fill the entire gap, is that correct? So uh, th this is confusing because people often talk about two different gaps. Um, yeah. There is the gap in terms of how much will it cost a developer, what's the opportunity cost to provide the affordable units. And then there's a gap in terms of is there a gap that's needed for development to meet a minimum profitability threshold to attract investors and lenders. And the intention with projects that choose the 20% to 50% option is if there is some of that second type of gap that the affordability requirements drop the profitability so low that it's below a minimum profit threshold, that TIF could fill in that gap up to the minimum profit threshold, but not cover the gap of all of affordable units in general. Thank you for that clarification. Um, with that, um, uh, you know, uh, it looks like we have nobody else from the public looking to come speak, uh, and so I will um, uh, move to receive and file uh, the public comment period. All those in favor say aye. Oh, we did for the uh, for the uh, for the presentation, yeah. Um, uh, and then uh, I will, yeah, put the I will give it to Council President Bender to make a last comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to give a couple comments about process um, and thanks to both staff and Grounded Solutions for the now years of work on this policy. Um, I do want to mention a couple things on behalf of the thousands of people that we didn't hear from today, but we as council members do hear from um, our constituents who are. Um, extremely concerned when they look into the future of our city and they look around their neighborhoods and see a future where they're not sure that they're um, going to be included in our communities. And that is a real thing that we hear from the people who elected us to represent them at City Hall. So the purpose and the reason behind this ordinance as one of many things we are doing to promote housing stability and affordability in our community is coming because our constituents and the people who elected us to be here have told us it's their highest priority. Um, 
I'm a little disappointed when we hear folks that we spend so much time with come and talk to us like we've never met before or we've never heard from you. I've spent I don't know how many hours over my six years in office at the Planning Commission, chairing the Zoning Planning Committee, meeting with developers, building projects in my ward. I don't know how many times a developer has told me they couldn't possibly build a building and follow our rules and then magically came back with a building that was feasible and did follow our rules. And so I think if, if folks want to come and, and tell us to listen more, I would encourage in the future then some less disingenuous rhetoric from, from in folks developing individual projects in our communities, as well as a more accurate reflection of the many, many, many hours our staff and council members have spent hearing from, listening to, and working through the details of not only this policy, but development projects across our city. Our context is very different than the communities around ours. We, you know that in downtown Minneapolis, building giant high rises can be built as of right. We have very little way to do an incentive-based inclusionary zoning policy like the suburban communities around us. It's not an option for Minneapolis unless we downzone our entire city. So I don't know why we keep talking about that option as if it's a realistic policy alternative for the city of Minneapolis and that those decisions weren't made decades, decades ago when none of us were in office. So I hope going forward that we can continue to have some thoughtful and respectful conversations, but I do want to just ground back as we close into the, again, thousands of people across our city who look into the future and expect us to do everything that we can to make this a co community and a city that they can call home. Thank you for those closing comments, and um, thank you to my colleagues for your questions, and thank you to Councilmember Goodman. I know we kept you a little bit. Uh, you didn't know we were doing the public comments, so I apologize for that. Um, uh, with, with no further business uh, before us, we are adjourned. Thank you all.